And, um, and one of the things I love to ask as a starter for conversations like this um, is how is your heart today? So let me know and let everyone else know, how is your heart today? Um, we will wait just a few more minutes to let everyone join. <laughs> Trinita said, hmm, how is your heart today? I'll share um, that my heart um, is a mixture of uh, fluttering and nerves, but also, uh, Latanya, you, you took the words out of my mouth. Um, there is a freedom. Uh, yeah, when I get to do presentations and speaking at, at engagements, engagements such as this, um, I find myself um, feeling a sense of freedom and liberation because sharing gives me life. Um, and I hope to give life to others when I do so. Um, yes. And Latanya, uh, your presentation um, was amazing. So I'm sure that your heart is light and free. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else here with us? We've got um, Trinita and Latanya. If you're here um, and you're able to share, let us know how your heart is doing today. Trinita, thank you for your honesty and your transparency. Um, yes, being irritated um, is a feeling I've had in recent days, months also. Um, and, and feeling a sense of uncertainty is definitely, uh, I think, a feeling we can all normalize because um, as we live through the pandemic, uh, or, or the pandemics, plural, I think that um, we're all finding our way. And I believe that today's um, mental health component of rethinking the church is, is a part of the work that we're doing um, to prioritize our own needs, even as we're caring for others. So Trinita, I hope that today's time um, allows you to work through a little bit of your irritation. We wanna honor that that's how you're feeling. And I'm sure you're not alone. <laughs> no problem. If you're just joining us, we are just waiting a few minutes for people to join, but we are asking that you type in the chat um, box. Let us know how your heart is doing today. Let us know how your heart is doing. We've had a few people share. Some of us are feeling um, light and free and others of us are feeling slightly irritated. Um, and that's okay too. Wherever you are, we wanna meet you where you are today. Um, and we're just gonna give it one more minute for people to join. And as you're joining, again, put in the chat box or the chat section, tell us how your heart is doing. Um, giving it to 12.35 and then we'll get started. Oh, the time just changed. So with that in mind, um, my name is uh, Ray Lundy, and I'm so excited to have the opportunity to um, speak a little bit today about a subject that is um, dear to my heart, uh, self-care. And it's been uh, a point of refuge and intervention for me. And I wanna talk today about how I believe it can be an intervention tool um, for, for those of us who serve as caregivers and those in the helping profession. If you're not in either of those and you're joining us today in our conversation, know that that's okay too, because we're all caring for someone in some way. Um, and I want to talk about how self-care self can be used to heal. But to do that, I want to center us all to the space 
first um, and I want us to engage in a brief activity. Uh, before we do that though, before we do the brief activity to center us, what I'd like to say is we're going to have a conversation today. So be sure to engage in, in the chat section. Um, I want to hear from you. We want to hear from each other because community, uh, healing happens in community. I firmly believe that we need each other to move through uh, any and everything in life, but particularly during this time. All right, so let me know in the chat section, are you ready to get started? You wanna get centered? Let me know how you're doing and we'll go. So, all right. So one of the things that is uh, critical to the work that I do as a clinical psychologist uh, is helping people connect to their bodies. Uh, when we think about, hi, Dr. Jackson, thank you for joining. Uh, when we think about um, being a caregiver, one of the things that happens is we begin to focus on others and out, those things outside of ourselves. Um, and when, as our uh, keynote speaker talked about today, um, self-care is often categorized as something outside of ourselves. But today, in everything we do in this particular talk, uh, we will make sure to reconnect and center to ourselves. So to begin, I'm going to ask that wherever you are, um, you plant your feet firmly on the ground, and I'll do the same. And if you're able, I want to ask that you sit back in whatever chair you're seated in, um, and if you're and if you feel comfortable doing so, allow your eyes to close or your gaze to fall um, down towards the floor. And with your eyes closed, feet planted firmly, um, I'm going to ask that you just take a deep cleansing breath in. And hold that breath and notice what it feels like to fill your lungs with air. And slowly, I'll ask that you exhale. Just exhaling slowly with your mouth open. We'll take two more cleansing breaths. I want you to take a deep breath in and hold the breath. Noticing your lungs fill with air and exhale slowly through your mouth. Last time, we're gonna take a deep cleansing breath in, holding it for just a few moments and slowly exhale out through your mouth. Eyes still either closed or gazed down. I want to ask you to imagine a place. And this will be a place where you feel totally and completely at ease and safe. I want you to go there in your mind. And I want you to pay attention to what you see in that place. Just kind of look around. For many of us, it may be home. Um, for some of us, it may be our offices. It may be our church. Um, for some of us, it may be our car. Um, it could be out in nature, near a body of water. Wherever that place is, I want you to settle your attention there. And I want you to allow yourself to look around. Notice what you see. Notice what you are surrounded by. And notice that each of the things in that space increases your sense of safety. While you're there in your safe place, I want you to continue to breathe calmly, um, but allow it to, to return to a normal pace. Um, and I want you to notice what you hear in that space, the space of safety. Wherever you are, I want you to take in the sounds. Take in the sights of what you see and notice your breath. Embrace the feeling of safety, calm, and ease. And the last thing I want you to do in, in your safe place, as you listen to the sounds and as you're looking around, I want you to pay attention to what you physically feel. Notice if there's a breeze, are you cool or are you warm? As you're there in your safe place, looking around, 
embracing the sights, noticing what you hear, and now lastly, what you feel. I want you to take the one last deep breath in. Slowly exhaling out and embracing all of the safety there in your safe space. And slowly bringing your attention back to this space. We'll open our eyes. Okay. So for those of you all who are just joining us, welcome. We are excited to talk about self-care as an intervention for vicarious trauma. And we engaged in a brief centering exercise to create a sense of safety within our bodies. Um, if you're there and you're able, can you tell us what came up for you as you were noticing um, the sights, um, what you saw, what you heard, and what you felt in your safe space? What came up for you? And if you're able, just drop us a line in your chat section, in the chat. I know for me, so I'm not seeing anyone chatting, but I know for me where I went, um, honestly, was where you see me today. I find myself feeling most comfortable in the work I do. Um, but often that means that I'm hearing um, in my work I'm hearing a lot uh, from my clients who are in traumatic experiences. So as a clinical psychologist and any of those of you all who are here, we know that the, the stories and the, and the experiences, the lived experiences of those we serve can be challenging. And today we'll talk about what's the byproduct of that? What happens when we um, hear repeated instances of trauma, essentially? Um, and so, as we delve into uh, the presentation, I want to ask a, a brief question. I want you, uh, well, actually, I'll guide you just through what we'll talk about. So we're going to define self-care, introduce an innovative self-care practice that a model that I've developed is called CRY. We're going to explore the CRY method. Uh, we're going to engage in a few activities like the one we just started with, and we're going to practice strategies. We'll end with that, okay? Um, but I love to start with this image because it, is, it, it elicits people's perspectives and their feelings, much like we just tried to do with your centering exercise. And I want to ask the question, um, what does self-care mean to you? And once you've had a chance to think about that, as you look at this image, tell us, tell us what you think. Okay. Hi, Tatiana. Thank you for sharing your heart. Um, Latanya, you said you were with your family. You heard women laughing, children playing, the smell of coffee treats. You felt safe and loved. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Latanya. Okay, as we think though today, as we're going through the, as we're going through our talk, and I shared with you that we're going to define self care. We're going to define vicarious trauma a little bit further, um, and we're gonna look at this model of CRY and, and how it can be used as an intervention for a vicarious trauma. I want you to think about the definition of self-care. Our talk today has been all, our summit today, um, this part of the summit has been about self-care, but as I listen to the various presentations, I recognize that we're all coming from a different place. So we wanna make sure our definitions are the same. Um, we wanna ground ourselves in this talk so you know exactly what I mean by self-care. Latanya, you said self-care is about prioritizing me and my well-being. So that's what comes up for you when you see this image and when you think about self-care, okay? Anybody else, what does self-care mean in light of what you see here in this image? Anybody else? Self-care, what does it mean? Well, for me, as I conducted the research, what I found itself, 
is that self-care most resonated with me when I looked at it being the intentional act of nurturing my or one's spiritual, mental, and emotional self. It's a holistic perspective. And like LaTanya shared, um, it was centered, um, okay? And like LaTanya and um, Yvonne are sharing, um, it sometimes means that we have to put our needs before we can take care of others. Um, And as helping professionals, as a clinical psychologist, that felt antithetical for me to what I was taught. Um, and, And I don't know if any of you all can relate, but when we're taught to provide support for others, Um, as clergy, as clinical psychologists, as anyone in the helping field, we're taught that the focus is on who? The other person. Um, But if our focus is solely on the other person without integrating this sense of what's going on for me, without centering ourselves as we did in the the beginning of our time today, what might happen? And so that's a question I want to pose to you all. What happens when we don't center ourselves, um, create a sense of priority, putting sometimes putting the needs of others before our own? Um, What happens? What can happen? What can be a byproduct of that? I know that what I found is that... um, I became what was referred to or is referred to in the literature as burnt out. So burnt out, burnt out, physically burned out. Yes, Yvonne, thank you. Absolutely. Um, And there's this image that I usually love to reflect upon of, and you may have seen it as well. It's a series of matches, right? And in the series of matches, um, you have... um, Uh, an array of matches that are not lit. And there's one match that's completely burned and almost down to the end of the match. Um, And so usually what we see with with that that reflection, if looking at that image, is that we've done so much looking at everyone else around us that we are depleted and don't have as much to give um, to, to others. So we've focused on, on others. We don't have as much to give to ourselves. Therefore, our work can be impacted. And so when we look um, at that as, a, as an experience, I have another follow-up question that I want to share. And I want to I say, what does this idea of self-care, that also this concept of vicarious trauma that we've been trying to define, how do those things look different for Black folks? What do you think? Is it, um, you know, I talked about it being something that seemed antithetical from someone who is a helping professional, but what does it mean to take care of self within the Black community? Is it at all different for us in terms of our ability to manage our well-being and our health? Are there extra things that, that provide stress Uh, that make taking care of ourselves more difficult? And I would argue, yes. I would argue that um, like the World Health Organization defines, that Black folks um, are under chronic levels of stress and that place us in a unique psychosocial contextual factor um, that essentially racism becomes an additional stressor, an additional trauma that makes taking care of ourselves absolutely challenging. Within our community, um, so LaTanya said, within our community, it often seems harder because a lot of us are living in survival mode. Absolutely. So survival mode might mean that um, we are concerned uh, about our physical safety, our psychological safety. Absolutely. Knowing that um, oftentimes our financial needs are not being met. And so the models of self-care that um, we traditionally think about have often um, kind of proposed or espoused that we are to, um, again, as I even mentioned, focus on us, but the barrier to doing that is oftentimes the racial inequities that are upon us as Black folks. And so in addition to 
um, the challenges. So we live in a state of perpetual, Dr. Jamie, thank you. We live in a state of perpetual anticip anticipatory grief. I absolutely um, know what you mean. And for those of, of you on the line here, um, we are anticipating that something negative will, can, and has happened. Absolutely. And so that becomes um, a compounded effect. And what we're really looking at here is like the intersectionality between our identity as Black folks um, and as caregivers and how that, that makes more complex this idea um, of vicarious trauma. Because essentially, we have um, the lived experience and the trauma of being a Black person. And then as a caregiver, um, it's compounded with the trauma that you may be supporting another person through. So really, these first few slides have been me trying to reiterate. Thank you, Dr. Jamie, for saying I'm helping you. You just helped me um, feel a little bit calmer. But really what we're saying here, I've been trying to give you, get, get some buy-in from everybody to say this idea of vicarious trauma, um, essentially, which I'll define explicitly here in the next slide, uh, but this idea of taking care of ourselves or, or engaging in self-care is not as simple as it looks. And so uh, with this idea that it's not as simple as it looks, I think my next slide, um, Okay, so here I'm talking about just as helping professionals, the impact of um, helping others, focusing on them deplete, can deplete our energy. Um, we can go numb, it can erode our soul. This was a really, uh, um, a, a research study of a thousand um, clergy and their experiences as being a helping professional um, and what the impact on them, uh, on their psyche was. Um, it talks about, how important, as a result of that research, we looked at how important we needed to do in terms of creating intervention strategies. And so um, I've, I'm sharing in these next few slides just the definition of what it looks like um, when we combine, like I said, that intersecting experience of being Black, of being a clergy person or a helping professional, a clinical psychologist, all of this continuum of experiences can lead to burnout, as we've already said. Compassion fatigue is another way of saying it. And, and at a deeper level, we ultimately are getting to how I'm defining vicarious trauma. Um, and vicarious trauma in the work that I, I've done, it looks at essentially is this residue that caregivers can have over hearing stories, witnessing pain and fear um, that those who we love and support have endured. Um, so what do we do? Well, I argue, well, actually first, I'm gonna make a, make a claim, but I wanna ask you what comes up for you when you see this image. Um, so Christopher, I'm so glad to hear that your research is in this area. Happy to know that you've joined and please chime in. We're gonna have questions at the end, but I wanna ask everybody what comes up for you when you see this particular image? Um, so we've defined, just to kind of recap, if you're just joining us, we've defined self-care as a, a recentering and a focusing on ourselves. Um, but I've been talking about how challenging it can be for us to do that in light of our role as helping professionals, whether that's clergy, whether that is for me as a um, clinical psychologist. Um, and so... We want to recenter. We want to focus on ourselves, but the work we're doing is is heavy, and there's this interacting barrier that can come um, because we we have our own trauma. Um, but I put this image here to say um, to say what what what's the resonation? So Christopher says that this image to him says we've got to do better. We've got to do better. Um, do better in what way, Christopher? What do you think? Do better in what way? Um, I know, yes, this image is negative for me too, Latanya. I, I think, and, and that was exactly what I wanted you to, to, to see, is that um, in addition to the self-care work that we know to do, uh, being something that, excuse me, in addition to helping others, and we know what they could be doing for themselves. 
oftentimes what can happen um, is this sense of guilt for the helping professional because we tell ourselves we should know what to do. We should know how to take care of ourselves. And so we shouldn't have the impact, the deleterious impact um, of the, the trauma, the lived experiences of others. And oftentimes we don't give ourselves permission to just be human, permission, permission to feel. There's this pedestal. I listened in on one of the other presentation and one of the, the comments in the section, in the chat box was, how can we as helpers or leaders um, take, prevent others from putting us on this pedestal? And I would say part of it starts with us knowing that even though we might understand that self-care is, is a recentering, um, that we we relieve ourselves of the notion that just because we quote unquote know the things to do, um, that, that that doesn't mean that um, we will exactly know, you know, kind of what that would look like for us. Um, and I wanna take a moment to just pause and make sure to just kind of give you a sense of like, why does this even, like, what does this look like in a practical sense? And so I want to share just a little bit about my story. Is that OK? Can I share a little bit with you about my story um, and, and what this how this image impacted me? So um, as a early professional, uh, I found myself working 16 hour days, um, being cons outwardly effective in the work that I was doing. Uh, and providing uh, my work clinically from what's called a cognitive behavioral approach. And so I'm helping people shift their thoughts uh, and, and ultimately have different ways of feeling so that their behaviors would change. Um, and in doing that reasonably effectively changing lives, so to speak, I got to um, probably my second year in my first place of employment in North Carolina, and I found myself burned out. So we talked earlier about burnout um, being just this overextension uh, and feeling a sense of fatigue. Uh, and I found myself feeling guilty about why things weren't getting better. And uh, it was that feeling that I should know better and do better that left me uh, headed towards clinical depression. Yeah, overextension, doc Dr. Jackson, absolutely. So as I sat there in my own clinical depression, thinking through, well, why couldn't I do things better? Because I know all the strategies, I knew all the tools, um, I realized that there had to be more than just the um, the idea of just focus on me, just get my nails done, just get my hair done. Um, and, and as our keynote speaker said today, just focusing on these external things that were going on around me. And essentially it led me to develop, I'm getting to this model that I was talking about. It led me to think through what was going on um, outside of the, the, the knowledge base that I had, what was going on uh, kind of internally with how I resonated with this idea of taking care of me. And it caused me to, um, to shift from an I should know better perspective to this idea that there is a way we could be using self-care that's beyond the nails done, hair done, more external passive ways of looking at self-care to one's a, a, a model of self-care that is more reflective, that is more intentional, that is more active. Um, and so the research I found was that self-care could be used as a prevention tool, not a reaction tool. So sometimes we think about it as reactionary, that we're exhausted, we're overextended. Um, and I got to a place with, with myself where I said, well, what if I had done something beforehand? And so I looked at integrating practices into my life that were very intentional. So if you recall, my very first slide um, or my second slide defines self-care as the intentional act of nurturing one's physical, spiritual, and emotional self. And the important factor there was intentional. 
And so here, as I was reevaluating my own experiences, I saw that self-care could be used um, as a way of life. Um, and I put an asterisk here, uh, again, because it's not by passive means, but more actively engaged, okay? Um, so preventative too, yes, yes, Dr. Jamie. Um, so we want to look at it um, as a prevention tool. So what does that look like? Well, that looks like being connected with, aware of, and um, in tune with ourselves on via the wellness wheel model. And what is the wellness wheel? Well, the wellness wheel is a, is a um, dimensional perspective that looks at wellness from a holistic perspective. Again, I share with you that self-care or my frame and most of the ways in which it is framed are, are um, less holistic and more um, focused on the things outside of ourselves. Um, and that, if you're looking at the wellness wheel here, that might be more of an environmental approach. Um, that might be more of um, an occupational approach. But when we think about our total well-being and who we are in our totality, self-care says, I'm going to focus on all of these areas. OK, so let's look here at the eight areas. And I want to kind of make sure you all are having an opportunity. Um, self-care can be used as a way of life. It absolutely is a way of life. Thank you, Dr. Catherine. Um, and yeah, I, this this is what I found to be, um, or in creating this is like one of the better ways to illustrate. It's almost like a flower, right? Dr. Catherine, I love that. Um, so, okay. So we're looking here at the eight areas of, of well-being, and we're going to make this connection between um, how self-care, even for Black folks who have this, this extensive, if we look at our ep epigenetics and the, the years of trauma we've experienced through slavery, if we look at our current stressors, um, whether it's the current stressor of racism, whether it's the challenges associated with financial, social, economic status, um, or whether it's the challenge of someone else's perception and how that impacts us. This uh, illustration here says that all of these areas regardless of what they are, are what we want to be intentional and in focusing on to make sure that we um, are um, taking care of ourselves and intervening on the trauma that's in, that has been um, enacted upon us, on the trauma that we have carried with us through our lineage. And so I want to break this down a little bit for you to say, well, what does this look like as it relates to cry? I mentioned this idea of cry, and you might, I'm sure you're asking, what, well, what, is, what is that? Well, looking at the areas of wellness, I believe that you can be intentional and in taking care of yourself by um, allowing yourself to move through these three things, being compassionate, reflecting on what you need, and then um, being integrative in your approach to give to, to taking the steps to, to do what you need for yourself in terms of self-care. So cry. Um, and I usually like to say at this point, that it's absolutely okay to cry. Crying is one of the things that is actually could be considered a self-care perspective or um, self-care experience and behavior. But as it relates to what we're talking about today, crying is essentially our ability to um, recenter our need for self-care internally. And to do that, the first element is to be compassionate. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of being compassionate and where that comes into play with our vicarious trauma, with our self-care, and what that looks like at a deeper level. So let's let's keep going. And thank you all for your comments. Um, wellness with the use of cry, compassion, reflective purpose, integrative intention. Yes. And it should be easy for us to remember that, um, given the acronym. Okay. So let's go a little bit deeper. So what does it look like to be compassionate? Well, 
when we think about compassion, again, as helping professionals or those who are looking, I told you traditionally, we look outside of ourselves. When we think about compassion here in, in this idea, this model of self-care that I'm presenting, I'm referring to the compassion we want to give to ourselves. So why would we want to be compassionate to ourselves? Well, I argue and I found in the research that I've done is that um, we the self-care strategies and tools that you may know in trying to develop an intentional practice, you may never do those things if you don't give yourself the permission to or the radical self-love um, enough to say, I am worthy of experiencing uh, the same care and the same love that I give to others. And so this idea of compassion is connected to radical acceptance and, and, and radical self-love that says, I want to nurture myself. Uh, I want to give myself the permission to not be okay. And I want to be willing um, to look at this idea that I'm not okay as a moving or fluid experience. There are moments, um, if we think about mindfulness meditation, there are moments when I feel really intense emotion. Um, but as I'm in engaged in the, the radical experience of being compassionate with myself, I realize that that feeling of not being okay, um, it will ebb and flow. Um, and all of that starts, though, with that first idea down here with awareness. We have to be aware that we're not OK. Then we will nurture ourselves and say, it's OK that I'm not all right. Um, and then we have a willingness to say, you know what, though, although it's intense right now, it will likely not stay that way. And so this is somewhat of a cyclical experience that I think happens in that first part of cry. Yes, Dr. Jamie, radical self-love. I think um, whether you are using the phrase self-care, self-love, grace, absolutely, Dr. Jackson, give ourselves the grace to say um, we will move through this experience. Because oftentimes as helping professionals, um, again, no matter the field you're in, we give grace to others, but not to ourselves. And really that's what cry um, and, and challenging ourselves to move through um, the experience of personal trauma as it relates to the secondary trauma we've been that we've experienced with others. Um, really moving through that is about um, giving ourselves that permission to move through the process and to focus on ourselves. Um, so that's the first step of CRY. Uh, it's compassion, which focuses on awareness, nurturing, and a willingness. Once we move through uh, that first stage of CRY, I think in order to use self-care as an intervention, we will become reflective. So this step is a reflective purposeful step and it asks us to ask ourselves three questions. And so the three questions that are really important, I'm actually gonna have you all ask yourselves these three questions. Um, yes, Latanya, I'm learning more and more to be gentle with myself as well. So I'm gonna ask, we're gonna make sure you can see the questions here. So we're gonna ground this a little bit better for you to say, okay, so how are all these pieces fitting together, Ray? So we're talking about self-care being an intentional act that's centered on me. I'm giving myself permission to be centered on me, even though I'm normally helping others. Um, and uh, I'm doing so in light of all the trauma that I'm carrying with me. Uh, and I'm going to ask myself these three questions in this second part of cry. I'm going to ask, what do I need? Why is this need critical? And how can I get this need met? And important for us to note here is that this is where self-care can, this is the crux of the intervention tool. So if I'm saying self-care can be used as an intervention, what that means is that in the moment, when we are experiencing a sense of traumatic reaction or in the moment. So, and so let me go back to say, I, I had a slide there that talked about that some, the impact to clergy helping professionals, those in this field is that sometimes not only do we get burned out, but we become numb we become um, disinterested, uh, we may have flashbacks of our own. And I'm suggesting that when we get to that experience, after giving ourselves compassionate um, uh, opportunity to say, how can I take care of myself? Then we're gonna engage in this, this next part of cry, which says, what do I need? 
when you find yourself having, if you find yourself having those experiences, I want to ask you to ask yourself, what do you need? Why is that need critical? And how can you get that need met? So if you're there with me in the chat section, I want you to think back to a recent experience that you have of feeling maybe shut down. And actually, I want to go back to we had um, earlier... Yvonne, was it Yvonne or no, it was Trinita. Trinita, if you're still there, Trinita shared um, very vulnerably that she was having a moment of irritation and frustration. And I think part of Trinita's experience was about um, some of the impact of COVID-19 on the work she's doing and how it limited her ability to take care um, of herself and those around her. So if Trinita were to in, in practice, what we're talking about here with Cry, she would say, what do I need? Why is the need critical? And how can I get that need met? Um, so she said that she was frustrated. It sounded in her statement that she shared with us in the chat that she needed some support. Um, if we go back to the, 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 the wellness wheel that I showed you earlier, one area on the wellness wheel that would allow us to get some support and get our self-care needs met would be the social well-being area. So I might suggest for Trinita or anyone else who's feeling the weight of the world of COVID and feeling maybe any isolation and frustration that you utilize your social well-being um, component of wellness and connect with someone. And if we think here, why is that need critical? It's because we're wired for connection. Connection is something that we can't live without. And how can we get that need met? Well, I argue that today's experience of this summit, this is an, a way that we're connecting with each other. Um, another thing that I'd say is um, we can get that net need met by, hi, Tatiana, thank and hi, Angelique, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're amazing, too. Um, so we can get the need met in multiple ways. It's a personal experience. Um, so I want to ask again, each of you to think back to a time when you, I used Trinita, Trinita's experience because she was so vulnerable, uh, but what's a recent experience of um, your own uh, trauma? And it could be related to COVID-19. It could be re related to racial injustice. What's, what experience has recently come to you? Get that in your mind. Um, COVID has made life particularly hard for people who are more introverted and tend to turn inward when sad. Yep, that's me, LaTanya. Absolutely. Um, and so if I'm feeling maybe not like um, Trinita was feeling frustrated, but if I'm feeling lonely, so LaTanya, if we, I'm an introvert and at times, yes, that loneliness has come up for me. I go to this part, the second stage of cry where I'm asking myself to be reflective and I say, well, what do I need? And if I'm feeling lonely, I then can look at whatever area of my wellness wheel that can, can help me with that. And I think social is a way. Sometimes though, if I'm feeling lonely, what do I need? My need might be spiritual. It might be to connect with God, okay? And if I connect with God, that might feel that feeling of loneliness and it might feel that void. And, it's, and that is a critical need for me to be connected with others um, because again, we're wired for connection. But these three questions are key because they help us to figure out, again, how do we get our needs met? Um, I'm aware of our time, um, but I'm going to quickly go through this last part of CRY and then let you all ask any questions about how it can be an intervention for the trauma we're experiencing. The last part of CRY just says that once you've identified what you need, what your trauma experience might be or what just your level of distress might be, then you want to plan effectively around how you will get that need met. You want to decide when you'll act on this engagement of self-care and then you want to actually engage. I want to draw your attention to the last part of this, this graphic though, where it has the hands together. Um, that hands together is really important because I am very intentional about encouraging people to have accountability partners because sometimes um, our our thoughts around how we can support ourselves uh, are, are are limited, and it's someone outside 
who can help us to see, well, maybe you're not, you, you, you've not thought of this or, you know what, you've thought it all the way through. I just want to honor and hold space with you while you move through this experience or this need that you have to move through um, this season where you're, you're needing to take care of yourself. Um, and so, the, again, the final part of CRY is integrative intention, where we're going to be intentionally giving ourselves the things we need, because our definition of self-care, again, was the intentional act of nurturing my spiritual, physical, and emotional well-being. It was a recentering on ourselves without the guilt, uh, without the idea that it's indulgent, and it um, required that... I'm arguing here in this last piece is that it requires that we are intentional and that we plan. Um, I'm noticing it's hard for you to see that last part. So yeah, proactively planning, deciding when to act, and then, then you're going to engage. So what does that look like practically? So here are a few things that I want to share as practical examples of what we can do to engage and cry. I want to I want to do my do a little quiz though to make sure you're with me. What are the what are the elements of cry? What's the first one? So element 1 of cry is compassion. Yeah. Um, the second part was being reflective and what were the three questions? Anybody remember the three questions? So I said that in the moment, if you're having an experience, you can ask yourself these three questions um, that will help you move through or intervene um Yep, what do I need is the first one. The second one was why is that need so important? So we talked about um, needing, mm -hmm. and the last one, <laughs> yes, Latanya, absolutely. Why do I need it? And the last one was how can I get that need met? And here are some practical examples of um, things that you can do to get the needs met, to work through the traumatic experience. Um, one, there's a great book that talks about um, how we hold trauma in our bodies. And so for me, one of the ways I work through my own trauma or stress reaction and response and a self-care practice is through movement. And I'm not sure if others of you have experienced this as well, as well but movement for me is healing and cathartic. And so um, therapeutic movement there, if you see the feet, uh, is a really, um, it's actually a very Afrocentric or, or for those of us from that, from the diaspora, it's actually something that's rooted and grounded in, in just who we are, uh, as is music. Um, and so as you're there, I want you to put in the chat section, what are some practices or ways in which, or have you ever utilized any of these particular practices um, as means of moving through difficult moments, moments that may have been um, traumatic or triggered by trauma responses. If you're there, anybody ever used, um, and, I'll, and I'll focus on one that is, I think, connected to this recentering that I've told you you need to do, but the daily intent intentions piece. Um, daily intentions are really critical way. And I shared, if you just start joining recently, I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist. And so I really think about how we uh, are processing our thoughts. And this idea of daily intention says that um, even before, if we're using self-care as a preventative strategy, um, even before I'm able to uh, approach a situation or before I have my triggered response, I'm gonna set my intention for the day, for the week, for the moment. Uh, and then if I am triggered in a moment of trauma response, then daily intentions, I can draw, return back to that daily intention as a way of um, self-soothing as a way of helping me to begin this practice of cry that we've talked about today. So intentions are extremely important. Uh, I see here, Angela, thank you for sharing silence and solitude. Uh, absolutely. I think that is also a way of practical self-care that we can engage in. Um, I'm going to shift because I want to leave us with some time uh, to uh, have questions. So I'm gonna just shift us to our last series of slides. Um, 
here are some really great references. I talked about the wellness wheel. Um, I talked about our cognitive perspectives. And the last piece I want you to know that as someone who is devoted to self-care, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. So here is my contact information. Um, I'm aware of our time. So I want you all um, Wow. Okay. So Dr. Jamie, you said you did an exercise where you say, I love you. I'm sorry. Um, forgive me. Thank you for myself. Um, absolutely, Dr. Jamie. Um, we do it for others, but not for ourselves. And that if you're, we're just joining at the very beginning, I talked um, about this being a recentering moment that in order to focus on uh, do engaging in self-care and realizing that it's not selfish, that we had to recenter, that we had to recenter ourselves. Um, I love that, Dr. Jamie. Um, any questions about the CRY model? Any thoughts that you have? Um, and, and I'll keep looking here in the chat, um, but I normally like to kind of wind down with, we opened with a centering exercise. And I wanna, since I shared with you how important I thought af intentions were, I was going to leave us with a set of um, affirmations and intentions for you to carry throughout the rest of your day. Um, if, if that's okay, I will move into that now. Um, if there's no other, other thoughts that you all want to share, questions that you have about CRY, how it can be used. Okay. Latanya, yes, yes, yes. We must re-envision what it means to be well and to live with purpose. Thank you so much for that. And then Dr. Catherine, Dr. Jackson, yes, love, love, love it. Affirmations, yay. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm going to affirm and I'm going to ask that I will. Um, so I will do we will, we're going to do three different affirmations and then we're, we're going to um, each time we're going to focus on a different part of our bodies. So I'm touching. So I want you to take your hands wherever you are. I want you to take your hands, you lift them up and I want you to put them on your belly. Okay, and again, like we did in our beginning practice, I want you to plant your feet flat on the ground and hands on the belly. And I want you to affirm these three statements. We're gonna do belly, we're gonna do heart, and we're gonna do mind, okay? So it'll be belly, heart, mind. Um, so our first affirmation is, May I be well. And may I be well, you're going to touch your belly. May I be at peace, you're going to touch your heart. And this third one, <laughs> this one's a little bit of humor, um, but I think it reflects if we talked about the the, the lived experiences of being helping professionals and how challenging it is to sometimes just let things go because we're so focused on other people. Um, we're gonna say, and may I let go of those things that don't serve me. So our first is may I be well, we touch our bellies. May I be at peace, we touch our hearts. And may I let go of those things that no longer serve me. One last time, touching our bellies, we say, may I be well. May I be at peace. And may I let go of things that no longer serve me. It's been a pleasure to share time with you all today and to share space. I hope that you've learned something and I'd love to hear from you if you are able or willing to reach out. Thank you for your time.